Chapter 1. How to make a successful teapot abduction. Rule 84 says make sure all abductees are comfortable. Remember, not all potential abductees will feel comfortable leaving the earth. Always offer nice biscuits and comfy chairs when trying to entice them. Without going on there. Lady Catherine de Burns is quite right. The teapot manual for human abduction states that all abductees must be willing. <laughs> Rule 36. Always ask an easy question to relax the subject. Humans can think for themselves, unlike many species in the galaxy, so asking them a question is often the best way to find out an answer. This can sometimes have unexpected results. We asked some abductees... What is astronomy? They don't always agree on the answers. Space. 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 The universe. Cosmic microwave background. The planets. Hmm... I think three light years, isn't it? Comets. Stars. A telescope. A galaxies. Monkeys or monkey brains. Satellite. Supernovae. Extra solar planets. Sun. Cluster of galaxies. A rocket. Trans-Neptunian objects. I don't know what the answer is. Some humans belong to a race called scientists, who are barely distinguishable from other humans. We asked the famous Earth astronomer Sir Isaac Newton why humans are fascinated by astronomy. Man is a curious creature. Uh, always, where there have been significant technical advances, we've learned vastly more about the universe. And it's 400 years since Galileo put his little telescope up uh, to his eye and began to realise that the moon had mountains and all sorts of things. Humans are curious and are always asking questions. Strangely, they seem to prefer it when they find answers they weren't expecting. Well, you know, the funding agencies have this thing about, you know, you, you've got to say what you're going to discover with a given experiment. And of course, astronomy hasn't worked like that. We've said, oh, we need, a, we need to be able to, we haven't seen anything in the ultraviolet or the x-ray or the infrared. So we need to look. We don't really know what we're going to find, but it'll be interesting. Well, that's one of the cool things about uh, studying exotic explosions in space is that the physics happens uh, in these things that we just don't see on Earth because it's the kind of energies that you only get when you blow up or crush uh, a star. So, you know, you can't probe that in the laboratory. What is astronomy? Detailed report. I would like to know if there's dust formed in supernovae. Yes. We feel passionate about dust. Star formation is... is is concentrated in very specific areas. Within a galaxy like our own galaxy, most of the star formation occurs in the spiral arms. So when you look at another galaxy like ours, and you see it laid out on the sky, the spiral arms are actually telling you where star formation has occurred recently. There isn't a huge concentration of material in the spiral arms, it's just that the very bright newly formed stars are there. This abduction has unusually high sub tea leaf interference, no, we are passionate about that. I mean, you know, Hayley's passionate about this. Every, every, a lot of people here are really totally fixated and obsessed with interstellar dust. For the moment, although we, we know now of something like 300 of these extrasolar planets, almost all of them are giant gaseous planets like Jupiter and Saturn in our, in our solar system. And, and actually, a majority of them are very much closer in to their host star than, than any of the giant planets in our system are. And the reason that is, it's entirely unsurprising, the reason that is, is because these are the ones that are easiest to find. The, all of these systems are found by their effect on the host star. And, and these are the planets that have the greatest effect on their host star, because they're large and because they're close to their planet. So these tiny, tiny fluctuations, which originated from uh, quantum fluctuations at the very birth of the universe, uh, have been imprinted on the cosmic microwave background, and they contain information about the formation of the universe, the evolution of the universe, the composition of the universe, 
uh, how much of the universe is dark matter, dark energy, and normal matter, if, uh, if, if these theories prove to be true. Instead of the universe's expansion slowing down uh, over time, instead it was speeding up. And so, you know, gravity should be making everything slow down, but somehow it was doing the opposite. Uh, things were, were speeding up, and so there must be some kind of energy that's making this happen, something that opposes gravity, a kind of anti-gravity. And uh, since we don't know what that is, we call it dark energy. But, of course, it's very different than... Um, dark matter, which is only called dark matter because it's matter that we don't know what it is. But um, maybe instead of dark energy, we should call it, you know, crazy, mind-blowing, we don't understand it energy. But that's essentially what's, what's going on is there, there's something there that's making the universe uh, speed up. And we figured that out from type 1A supernovae. So we can use the type 1A supernovae as... Uh, these standard candles and use them to map out the history of the expansion of the universe. Um, the origin of galaxies, or the origin of elliptical galaxies, because uh, we already know that there's a population of dust enshrouded objects in the early universe that people suspect might be the um, progenitors um, of nearby galaxies today. And Herschel will allow us to make the connect should allow us to make the connection between this this population in the very early universe that we're seeing billions of years in the past and, and the ellipticals today. It's a pretty incoherent explanation. Step fourteen: Never allow your subject to leave. Does the universe make sense? Who knows? Rule 93. Always remember, put your human abductees back where you found them, with a choice of biscuits, a strong cup of tea, and a smile on their face. Smile optional.